Welcome to Through the Bible with our teacher, Dr. J. Vernon McGee. I'm Steve Schwartz, your host on this five-year journey through God's entire Word, and I'm so glad that you're with us on the Bible Bus today, as this week we've started an important leg of our expedition through the Old Testament book of Isaiah. We started Isaiah 1, verse 4, and we're going to learn about the three steps in the downfall of any nation. See if any of these sound familiar to you. First, there's spiritual apostasy, then moral awfulness, and finally, political anarchy. Dr. McGee says most people don't pay attention to that cycle until political anarchy is reached, and then they cry out that the government must be changed. Well, you may be surprised to hear this analysis of the state of our country given by Dr. McGee so many years ago. However, as we find out in our study, the problem isn't the government. The real problem is the condition of men and women's hearts apart from God. Isaiah's message to Israel 2,700 years ago is also appropriate for our 21st century culture in our country and every nation of the world. And you know, that's why Through the Bible continues to return to Jesus' command in Mark 16, 15, to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And in spite of the universal condition of man, that call is getting easier to obey. For example, did you know that thanks to the digital world we live in, Through the Bible is now heard all around the world in over 250 different languages? At the time that God called Dr. McGee home, we were in only about 30 of those languages. Imagine how Dr. McGee would be delighted in that growth. And right now, through individual apps or by visiting ttb.org, you can hear the daily program of God's Word on Through the Bible in over 100 languages. They're such a great resource for your family, your friends and neighbors, and maybe those who don't speak English. You can find out more about Through the Bible's different language programs when you stop by ttb.org. Taking the whole word to the whole world is our mission, it's our passion, and it's our daily goal. In addition to God's grace, this is made possible by our faithful friends like you who pray and financially support this worldwide effort to follow Jesus' command until he comes again. If you'd like to partner with us, maybe providing a tank of gas for the Bible bus or maybe a new set of tires to keep us on the road, then visit ttb.org forward slash give or call us at 1-800-65-BIBLE. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for making your word come alive. We're listening, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. It's time to begin our study in Isaiah 1 on Through the Bible with Dr. J. Vernon McGee. Now, actually, last time we just opened the book of Isaiah, we got down to the fourth verse of the first chapter. And this is a tremendous opening because it reveals God in the courtroom of his universe. He's called all of his created intelligences to hear that what he's going to do is just and right. We see him now as the judge of all the earth, and he is the judge here of his own people, the nation that he called. And that to us is strange today because God seems out of character to be in the position of a judge because in the thinking of the world today, God's been removed from the throne of judgment. He's been divested of his authority. He's been robbed of his regal prerogatives. He's been shorn of his locks as the moral ruler of the universe. He's been bowed to the edge of the world and pushed over as excess baggage. God's going to judge this universe someday, and he judged his own people. And that ought to be a warning, not only to individuals, but to nations, that God still judges nations. He's made his charge. Now he's going to be specific, and he's going to offer his charge in a very specific way. In verse 4, will you listen? Ah, sinful nation. They're his people, a people laden with iniquity. And that word laden with iniquity throws a world of light upon that invitation that when the nation rejected him, that is the Lord Jesus, he gave this personal invitation. He said, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. Laden with what? Well, laden with sin, a people laden with iniquity. A people laden. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll rest you. And that's the rest of redemption. Now he says here, a seed of evildoers 
children that are corruptors. They have forsaken the Lord. They have provoked the Holy One of Israel under anger. They are gone away backward. Now he has spelled out the charge here. And this charge is that they are in a backslidden condition. They have turned away from God and they are a people laden with iniquity. Now, God is going to spell out in detail this charge that he's made against them. And this brings to mind the philosophy of human government that God operates on. He has a system of political economy. I must say it's not the world's system, but it's God's system. And the interesting thing is that the world doesn't seem to be running on man's theory of political economy because nations rise and fall, and they fall because they follow their own political economy. And this nation of Israel was. Now, we saw that system given to us back in the book of Judges. We saw these people, they were serving God, being blessed of God. God prospered them, and then they began in their prosperity to turn away from God. And as they did, they turned finally to idolatry. They forgot God. In fact, they were in rebellion against him. And then God delivered them into the hands of the enemy. Then they began to cry out to God for deliverance. Then they turned to God. And when they did, he delivered them and brought them back again to the place of blessing. Therefore, we have given in the book of Judges that which is followed all the way through Scripture, and history corroborates it. And that is that there are three steps in the downfall of any nation. There's, first of all, religious apostasy. Second, there is moral awfulness. And third, there is political anarchy. And a great many people don't pay any attention until we reach the place of political anarchy And then they begin to cry out that the government should be changed and that there should be a new system adopted. Well, the problem is not in government. The problem was not in Jerusalem, in the palace. The problem was in the temple. And it all begins with spiritual apostasy. Now, God puts his hand down upon this nation. He didn't go and put his finger down on the king. He could have, and he did have a great deal to say about it. But here, that's not the place. And then he didn't put his finger down on the moral awfulness that there was in the nation. He could have. He put his finger down on that which was spiritual. Will you listen? He says, why should ye be stricken any more? Ye will revolt more and more. The whole head is sick, the whole heart faint. From the sole of the foot, even under the head, there's no soundness in it. But wounds and bruises, putrefying sores, they've not been closed, neither bound up, neither mollified with ointment. There was moral awfulness, but that's not his charge. Your country is desolate. Your cities are burned with fire. Your land, strangers devour it in your presence, and it's desolate as overthrown by strangers. That's verse 7. And here you see political anarchy. But God is just stating a fact. He's not bringing a charge here. But listen to him now. The daughter of Zion is left as a cottage in a vineyard, as a lodge in a garden of cucumbers, as a besieged city. Except the Lord of hosts had left us a very small remnant, we should have been as Sodom, and we should have been like unto Gomorrah. In other words, if there hadn't been a faithful remnant, God would have destroyed the nation as he did Sodom and Gomorrah. But there's always been a remnant among those people that had been for God. There's a remnant today. And I don't think you find them back in Israel, although there's some lovely Christians back there. But they really are not even big enough to be a remnant. But there is throughout the world. Now, listen to him. He's now calling again to hear the word of the Lord. This is verse 10. Ye rulers of Sodom, give ear unto the law of our God, ye people of Gomorrah. To what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices unto me? Now he's spelling it out. The whole problem was religious apostasy. They were coming and bringing sacrifices. He says that. 
I'm full of your burnt offerings of rams and the fat of your fed beasts, and I delight not in the blood of bullocks and of lambs or of he goats. When ye come to appear before me, who hath required this at your hand to tread my court? The problem was in the temple, you see, and it was a spiritual problem. Now, they went through the form and the ritual, but their heart was far from God, and it didn't affect their conduct. Now, friends, that today is the problem in the church. That's the problem among believers today. A great many of us have reached the place where we have a form of godliness, but we deny the power thereof. Now, he says to these people, bring no more vain oblations. That is empty sacrifices. Incense is an abomination unto me, and the new moons and Sabbaths, the calling of assemblies I cannot away with. It's iniquity, even the solemn meeting. God says even that which he gave becomes wrong when the heart is not in it and it doesn't affect the conduct. And when you spread forth your hands, I'll hide mine eyes from you. He says this is verse 15. Yea, when you make many prayers, I'll not hear your hands are full of blood. Wash you, make you clean, put away the evil of your doings from before mine eyes cease to do evil. Learn to do well, seek judgment, relieve the oppressed, judge the fatherless, plead for the widow. God says that you're nothing in the world but a bunch of phonies. You come into my presence as if you are real and genuine. You go through the sacrifices but they become absolutely meaningless. Now, may I say to you, God now has a charge against them, and he's been spelling it out, and there's no question, no question at all about it. Now, the problem was there, which was spiritual or religious apostasy for these people. It had led to moral awfulness, and it had led to political anarchy in the nation but their trouble was here. Now God has called them into court. He's proved his charge against them. Now what's he going to do? I tell you, the prisoner stands at the bar waiting for the sentence of judgment, and God now could move in and judge them. But will you listen to him? Even at this late moment, God says to them, settle your case out of court. God says, don't go into court with me because you're going to lose. You're bound to lose. And he says, now, I have something for you. And this is amazing. You can't believe your ears when you hear this. Isaiah 1, I'm reading. Come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they'll be as wool. God says to them, settle your case out of court. And you remember that was the thing that he said to his people, the Lord Jesus did. He says, agree with your adversary in the way. Don't wait till he takes you into court. God says, settle your case out of court. And God says, I have a secret formula. I have a private prescription and it'll take out sin. Though your sins be as scarlet, they'll be white as snow. they be red like crimson. They should be as wool. What is that? That's the blood of Christ. The blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, just keeps on cleansing us from all sin. And God says, agree with your adversary quickly whilst thou art in the way with him. And God says, I have a charge against you, but I can take my divine alchemy and you want to know where you find that? In the 53rd chapter of Isaiah, when you see the crucified Christ. Now, may I say to you that this is God's charge against his people. And this is the basis on which now he's giving them an opportunity to turn to him. And if they will turn to him, he'll preserve the nation. And he's going to give them now almost a hundred years. And then... They don't turn to him. They don't change their ways. And then he'll send them into captivity. Now, that's the interpretation of this. Now, it has an application. Here's a good example of interpretation and application. I have a little book, and the title of the little book is America Needs a Declaration of Dependence. It's based on this passage of Scripture. Now, we have today, I think, the same thing 
that you have here. You have, first of all, in this country, political anarchy. I don't think there's any question about that. I think it's obvious by now, friends, that men cannot solve the problems, not only this nation and certainly not of the world, and we want to solve the problems of the world. But we have seen that this is the way that a nation goes down. This is the way this nation did. It's the way that Rome went down and all other nations. Gibbon, he gives five reasons for the decline of the Roman Empire. Five steps downward. Will you listen to them? He says, first, the undermining of the dignity and sanctity of the home, which is the basis of human society. Second, higher and higher taxes, the spending of public money for free bread and circuses for the populace. Third, the mad craze for pleasure, sports becoming every year more exciting, more brutal, more immoral. Fourth, the building of great armaments when the great enemy was within, the decay of individual responsibility. And fifth, the decay of religion fading into mere form, losing touch with life, losing power to guide the people. Now, if you go through this, you'll see the three steps downward. First of all, there is spiritual apostasy. Second, moral awfulness. And third, political anarchy. It was Clinton Rosita, who was professor of American institutions at Cornell, who said, speaking of our nation, in our youth, we had a profound sense of national purpose, which we lost over the years of our rise to glory. James Reston in the Wall Street Journal, and this was some time ago, made this statement. He made a distinction between the statements of public men in Washington, what they say in public and what they say in private. He says in public, they talk about how optimistic and wonderful the future is, but the private conversations of thoughtful men here in Washington are quite different. For the first time since the war, one begins to hear of doubts that mortal men are capable of solving or even controlling the political, social, and economic problems life has placed before them. Now, friends, that was several years ago. Where are we today? Now, as America is being looked at today, I'm not just giving you the viewpoint of a wild-eyed fundamental preacher, for that's what I am, but I'm not wild-eyed, I hope. Dr. Seagrave Singer, he's professor of history in Salisbury, North Carolina. He says the American dream is vanishing in the midst of terrifying realities and visible signs of decadence in our contemporary society. You go back in our political history and you can see today that there is this deterioration. But I don't think God had put his finger down on Washington. What about moral awfulness? Well, I could bore you with a great many statistics in this connection, but all you have to do is read the paper today. And way back in 1952, and this has been going on some time, they gave these alarming statistics. At that time, there were 15 million sex magazines that were read monthly by a third of the nation. What about it today? Three times as many criminals as college students. How about that today? And many of the college students have turned criminal. One million girls infected with social disease. And I understand that one out of four that graduate from high school in Southern California are infected with it today. We've come a long way since these days, and these were terrible. 100,000 girls enter white slavery each year. One million babes born in illegitimacy yearly. Two out of three marriages end in divorce. And now in Southern California, the divorces equal the marriages. 45 suicides every day. One murder every 40 minutes. Now I think it's 40 seconds. One major crime every 18 seconds. 100,000 unapprehended murderers walk the street. That was in 52. 21-year-olds represent the largest criminal group. That was in 52, but today it's the 18-year-old group. And I tell you that there has been that step down in moral awfulness. But I don't really think God would put the finger there. Move on down to spiritual apostasy. What about that today? The very interesting thing is Dr. Walter Tunks of the University of Akron made this statement. 
In the last 6,000 years, there have been 21 civilizations, and every one of them has gone on the rocks precisely at the point where they let God go. And the Wall Street Journal had an editorial during the time of the Depression, and this is amazing coming out of that journal. What America needs today is not government controls, industrial expansion, or a bumper corn crop. America needs to return to the day when Grandpa took the team out of the field in the early afternoon on Wednesday in order to hitch them to the old spring wagon into which Grandma put all the children after she washed their faces shining clean, and they drove off to prayer meeting in the little white church at the crossroads underneath the oak trees where everyone believed the Bible. May I say to you, friends, we've come a long ways. Dr. Albert Heimer, the professor of history at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor, said the United States of America in the past 50 years has been dominated to a large extent by persons who do not understand the spiritual heritage bequeathed by their own ancestors. And Dr. Machen said, America's coasting downhill on a godless ancestry, and God pity America. Friends, we've hit the bottom of the hill. That's where we are today. But God is saying to us today, Come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Today, there's a way out for America. But if America goes like other nations, and we're moving in that direction, our time is limited as a great nation, by the way. There is a way out. Philosophy says, think your way out. Indulgence says, drink your way out. Politics says, spend your way out. Liberalism says, legislate your way out. Science says, invent your way out. Industry says, work your way out. And labor says, strike your way out. And fascism says, bluff your way out. And militarism says, fight your way out. The Bible says, pray your way out. And the Lord Jesus said, I am the way out. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. And I'm the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved. That's the only hope of America today, friend. It's the only hope of our country today. And there's a place where people need to turn to God today. It's in Bible-believing churches. It'll have to begin there. And if it doesn't begin there, I don't know whether it's going to begin anywhere today. So until next time, may God richly bless you, my beloved. You know, people often ask what was Dr. McGee's favorite verse in Scripture, and I'm sure that he had many. But one that I know of comes to mind in light of today's message from Isaiah. It's that courageous passage in Revelation in which God says, I have set before you an open door and no one can shut it. In fact, it's through the Bible's ministry theme verse. And it's a good reminder that God isn't hindered by corrupt governments or by people whose hearts are far from him. God will accomplish the work that he intends in history and in our hearts. Dr. McGee also mentions this in his digital booklet on Isaiah 1 called America Needs a Declaration of Dependence. In it, you'll find the quotations by Gibbon about the five reasons for the decline of the Roman Empire and other quotations about the moral and political state of our nation. Download your free copy at ttb.org forward slash booklets. And then another one of Dr. McGee's booklets that you may find helpful is Forget About It, How to Put the Past Behind You. If you're still worrying over sins of your past and maybe you need some help moving forward with hope and confidence and joy, this teaching from Philippians 3 will be especially meaningful to you. These are just two of the more than 100 of Dr. McGee's booklets and many other Bible study resources that are available for free to download when you visit us at ttb.org. Now, if you want to find out more about these resources and the many terrific tools we offer to help you go deeper in your knowledge of the love of God's Word, just visit ttb.org or call us at 1-800-65-BIBLE or email biblebus at ttb.org. Of course, we'll always be glad to read your letter too. So would you write to us? Through the Bible, Box 7100, Pasadena, California, 91109 is the address in the U.S. If you're a Canadian listener, then write to Box 25325, London, Ontario, N6C, 6B1. 
Next time, our five-year journey through Scripture continues with more in this fascinating study. If you have the chance, why don't you read ahead through Isaiah chapter 2 to prepare for what we'll learn. I'm Steve Schwetz, and as always, I'm going to be here saving a seat on the Bible bus just for you. Today's study with Dr. J. Vernon McGee is brought to you by Through the Bible, and it's made possible by the generous prayer and financial investments from listeners like you on the Bible bus all around the world.